She's one of the most prominent CEOs and women in tech history. Meg Whitman ran eBay for a decade, then ran a heated campaign as the Republican candidate for governor of California. Whitman lost that race, but didn't stop there. She took over the struggling tech icon, Hewlett Packard, running a massive turnaround effort that ended with her splitting the company in two. But she's found her next and latest act outside of Silicon Valley. She's teamed up with DreamWorks founder Jeffrey Katzenberg to start Quibi, which they believe will revolutionize entertainment. Joining me today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Quibi CEO Meg Whitman, also the former CEO of eBay and HP. So good to have you here, Meg. Well, I'm glad you're here. The last time we talked, you were CEO I know. of <laughs> HP. You've had a few life changes I have. in the last year. I know. Yeah, well, I stepped down from HP in March of um, this past year, and I thought, you know what, I'll take a break, I'll do some things. I'm the incoming chairperson of Teach for America, so I was going to focus on that, and so still So did you am. take a break? Not really, <laughs> <laughs> which might be my nature, I'm afraid. Um, but my longtime friend, Jeffrey Katzenberg, came to see me after I was saying I was stepping down from HP, and he shared with me this idea that he had for what has become Quibi. At the time, it was called New TV. And I spent about three and a half hours at dinner with him, and at the end of dinner, I said, this is a really good idea. I might have one more startup in me. And you and Jeffrey met at Disney. We met at Disney. You also were on the board of DreamWorks. Mm -hmm. Did you want to leave the proverbial Silicon Valley? I mean, were you ready for a change? You know, I wasn't thinking that I was necessarily going to leave Silicon Valley. I mean, I love the Bay Area. It's been our home for much of the last 30 years. But now you live here. But you now moved I lived here. Yeah. Well, when you do a startup, you actually have to live where the company is. And ultimately, I decided that we had to be together. And you were employee number one. I was employee number one. So Quibi means quick bite. Yes. This is a short form video platform yep. betting on six to 10 minute episodes of short form content. Why do you think that's the future? Well, I think a couple things. We all know the revolution that has um, you know, been started by mobile. And today, think about it, our, you know, our target audience of 25 to 35 year olds is spending nearly five hours a day on their mobile. And this use case is every morning you leave your home with a little TV in your pocket called your smartphone and you've got all these in-between moments. You know, you're waiting for me to come meet you here. You're waiting for a friend for lunch. You're waiting at a doctor's office and you want you have 10 minutes and you want to see something great. And what you're doing today is, you know, watching some of the great, you know, YouTube and, um, you know, Snapchat and Facebook. You're doing obviously social networking and uh, maybe playing casual games. And so we want to steal a little bit of that in-between time by making Hollywood quality content in short form. Now, it's interesting you mention YouTube, Snapchat, mm -hmm. Facebook, because it doesn't seem like the audience has flooded there in droves for their short form content. So what makes you think that yeah. this is the right idea, that this is the golden length? Well, YouTube you know, does largely user generated content. And this is not user generated content. This is produced Hollywood quality content with the greatest directors, producers, showrunners, actors and directors that we can put together. And it's a really unique content strategy that we think will fit that on the go lifestyle perfectly. And you know, you can't afford to make this quality content if advertising is your main form of monetization. So this will be advertising plus subscription, which allows us to spend the hundred to $125,000 a minute for our, what we call our lighthouse stories. So it's $8 for ad free, $5 uh, ad supported. Correct. What makes you think people are going to pay for another subscription service? Yeah. Netflix just raised their prices. Yeah. Well, this is a very different use case than Netflix. Netflix is fantastic for you get home from work or you're on a weekend, you want to invest in hour, an hour and a half, deeply immerse yourself in a show. Um, we're going after a completely different use case during the day. Do you remember when HBO launched? Their tagline was, we're not TV, we're HBO. They spent a lot of money. Band of Brothers would be, in today's dollars, $30 million an episode. And they were able to do um, content like Sopranos and others that would not have been allowed on network TV. And today there's, I don't know, 160 million HBO subscribers. So we think this can be, can live right, right alongside whatever you choose to um, subscribe to. So you've raised a billion dollars from yes, some of the have. major studios, yes. Disney, you know, Warner, you know, investors in China. Mm -hmm. Is that really enough to compete with the likes of Netflix? So we don't actually think we're competing with Netflix per se. Um, you are competing with for mind share though, well, and attention. Well, it's a different time of day, honestly. Now, only about 10% of Hulu, Netflix, you know, these long form OTT is actually watched on mobile. 
um, they are primarily a living room experience. So this is a different, entirely different use case. I would actually say we're probably competing more against maybe social networking, casual gaming than we are Netflix. You've attracted yeah. some big names, we have. Spielberg. This is where my partner Jeffrey Katzenberg is so central to the success of this company because he has been in Hollywood for 40 years. He's very well known, highly respected, and he has been able to curate some of the best showrunners, directors, um, stars to um, make content for us. And there's really three kinds of content. First is what I would call stories that are long but are told in short chapters. And I'll give you an analogy in another medium, The Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code is 464 pages and 105 chapters, meaning each chapter is five pages long. If you have five minutes, you read one chapter. If you've got 10 minutes, you read two chapters, and that's why Dan Brown wrote it that way. But nothing about the Da Vinci Code is lesser, except for the length of the chapter. Then we have content that we think is really quite unique to Quibi. If you saw it on some other platform, you'd go, well, that's sort of strange that it's here. You know, one of our favorite ones is, you know, Justin Timberlake's gonna host a show with singers, um, and the question is, who was the song and who was the singer that inspired you? It's really a show about inspiration in six and a half minutes, right? You know, just a little gem that you might watch while you're on the go. Is there a target audience? Is it TV for millennials or younger than millennials? It's millennials. It's 25 to 35 is our target target because, you know, startups are all about focus. You know, how about we do a small number of things really well as opposed to try to solve world hunger? And what about distribution? Yeah. So first of all, it's an app. We may well do a partnership with one of the streaming music services. We will also um, have the talent help market this. And then, of course, we will do brand advertising because we have to explain to people what this is because it's a completely new behavior and a new form. Just in the last year mm -hmm. that you've been working on this, I mean, the, the streaming landscape has changed dramatically. Disney's pulled their content from Netflix. Yes. Disney launching its own streaming service. Warner, Comcast mm -hmm. launching their own yes. streaming services. I mean, how do you keep up? I've almost never seen an industry be as disrupted as the film and television business is today. So there's lots of change, lots of new entrants. Most of the competition today is moving towards long form OTT streaming services. And they're all, you know, chasing Netflix, honestly. Um, we're doing, while well, everyone is zigging, we're zagging. I've heard completely binary views on Netflix. One is mm -hmm. that they could be like the AOL of OTT mm -hmm. because if, you know, Disney and other companies are pulling their yeah. content from Netflix, then, then, you know, what does Netflix have? Well, first of all, we have tremendous respect for Netflix and Reed Hastings and Ted Sarandos. I mean, let's just pause for a moment and contemplate what they have built. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary, and they have revolutionized an industry, and they have incredible content, and, you know, the best talent in Hollywood making content for them. So I think this will be a battle, but I think, you know, there's going to be room for one or two players here, maybe even three. And, you know, it's, I think it's very much possible that, that Netflix continues to do very well. So you think there will be consolidation, but that Netflix is one of one will that... will be certainly one of the winners. I can't see a, a scenario where Netflix is not one of the winners. But do you think as many streaming services as exist now will exist in the future? Probably not. I mean, typically watch when you watch a new industry be born. Think back to the car industry at the turn of the last century. What, at one point there were something like 100 car companies, you know, and now there's effectively three U.S. car companies. So I suspect there'll be a lot of entrants and then there'll be a consolidation and there will be winners and losers. But I think, you know, certainly Netflix and Disney, I'm sure, will be a winner. I think we need to be prepared for a global economic slowdown. So you're now an outsider looking in on Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. It's been a volatile year for yeah. tech. Hundreds of billions of dollars wiped off the market caps of Facebook, mm -hmm. Apple, mm -hmm. Alphabet, mm -hmm. Amazon. Scandals around Facebook and iPhone sales slow down. Government scrutiny yes. of tech. Why do you think the clouds have suddenly darkened yeah. over Silicon Valley? So I think, first of all, let me tell you what I think is still remarkable about Silicon Valley, especially being removed. You almost appreciate some things even more. It is the most entrepreneurial place in the world. It's a 
hub and a, just a, a center of ideas and new thoughts and ideas. It's, it is, I think, honestly, the most creative place in the world. And that is still true. I don't think that changes. Some of this is just growing pains and growing up. And, you know, I have confidence that these companies will sort out some of their challenges and, you know, there'll be some bumps in the road. Facebook has run into a pretty big bump in the they road. Have. I mean, lots of controversy, scandals, loss of user trust. Mm -hmm. Where do you think Facebook went wrong? You know, it's so easy to um, look at these companies and then now say, well, where did they go wrong? Um, listen, when you are growing at that rate, you have become so ubiquitous. You do the best job you can at the time, and sometimes you make mistakes. Sometimes you don't see things as clearly as you might have. And the question is, you will make mistakes. Now the question is, how fast do you fix them? And, um, you know, the proof will be in the pudding. But I think there's certainly a commitment from the top of that company to fix some of the mistakes that they, you know, have acknowledged making. You navigated a historic split at HP. Mm -hmm. Do you think some of these companies, these big tech companies, are too big for their yeah. own good? I don't know. I mean, I felt certainly that HP had to be broken into smaller, more nimble pieces. You know, there was a time for a big IT supermarket, you know, in the 80s and 90s where tech spending was, you know, rocketing. But then there comes a time where an industry shifts and I think you become too big to be nimble enough to fight off the competitors that are now disrupting you. And that's what we saw at HP. I think when industries get quite mature or there's a different life cycle that you're faced with, then sometimes smaller is better. Not always is bigger, better. So we'll see. I don't think the same thing is driving this right now. This is more, you know, people are asking, is it just too big because there's, you know, too much power consolidated in these companies? That's different than what we faced at HP. Do you think regulation is a real threat to these companies? So um, I think that the government is very interested in these companies. And, um, you know, having been a politician, what I will tell you is politicians, you know, they see something happen and then their instinct is, OK, what should we be doing to regulate that industry or protect consumers? And that instinct isn't necessarily wrong. They have to know what they're doing and they have to be thoughtful about it. But, you know, there may be a role for some regulation. So of the sort of big tech companies, where do you see the biggest risk? Well, I will tell you, tech is moving at lightning speed. I've never seen anything quite like this. You know, I think in my early days of my career, you had sort of, you know, you'd see trends coming and you had a year or two or three to adapt. Now you have a month or two <laughs> or three to adapt. I think the biggest challenge is the time of innovation has shrunk dramatically. And you just see these new companies come out of, any, come out of nowhere that disrupt the very thing that you thought was safe. Are Facebook and Apple and Google, are they disruptable? Amazon? You know, I suspect they are. Okay, so, you know, Jeff Bezos has said someday Amazon will be disrupted. And, you know, you read about Sears today. And Sears 100 years ago was the Amazon of that time. And, you know, they've been disrupted. You know, business is Darwinian. There's no question about it. When you were running eBay, mm -hmm. you made a pledge to win China. Well. Yes. Alibaba won China, and actually no U.S. tech company has really won China. eBay didn't, Amazon didn't. You are right about that. You said whoever wins China wins the world. Mm. Is, is China as important today as it was back then? I think China is very important. And you may know that our uh, joint venture partner in China is likely to be Alibaba. And um, I'm just glad to be on the same side as them this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge film market, yes, yes. but it's also been difficult for yes, US, this it US has. entertainment industry to crack. I mean, China is a very unique market. And I think, you know, it's, it's unwise, I think, to try to think about going to China alone. I mean, I lived in China for four months when I was trying to fix eBay in China, and it's just completely different. And so having a strong partner who understands that market, I think, is, is really important. So what will Alibaba provide? They have, you know, tremendous scale in China. I mean, it's remarkable um, how much they have grown in the last 20 years and obviously have a platform um, called Yuku. They have, you know, uh, Alibaba Pictures. They have, you know, music. They've got a lot of entertainment properties that, that hopefully we can leverage, and they have remarkable technology. What's your take on the U.S.-China trade tensions yeah, yeah. as we sit here in the middle of a trade war? Yeah. Well, um, I think maybe you know this about me. I, I tend to be a free trader. You know, I think global trade, while there is dislocation associated with global trade, is actually the right thing to do. And, you know, you want it to be a level playing field, and I'm certain there's some things we can do better with China. But honestly, the free movement of goods and ideas and trade has always been the right thing for the United States. So and what's at stake? 
Well, I think, you know, listen, I think we have to be there very thoughtful. They are the second largest economy in the world. There's lots of things that we should be doing together. Is it good for every single person in every single community? No, but overall, it's the right thing to do. And then we as a country have to keep our eyes on what are the next industries? What are the growth industries? Whether it's immunotherapy or 3D printing or robotics or AI, let's make sure that we are the best in the world at the industries of the future. Um, because that's always been what has made America great. Are you concerned about a, a sharp Chinese economic slowdown? Listen, the economies of the world are now completely interconnected. Mm -hmm. And so what happens in the United States influences China, what happens in China influences Europe. And so, you know, to the extent that there is, you know, a, a trade war, there's other things that, that disrupt this connectivity, you know, it's very possible that you see a slowdown. And what about a broader macroeconomic slowdown? You know, if you look at the trends, you would argue that we're due for some kind of a contraction or a correction, and you've seen that in the markets in December and a little bit of this year. So I think we need to be prepared for a global economic slowdown. You've lived through a couple of bubbles, and I know I all bubbles don't look the same, right. but are we in one? No, it doesn't feel to me the same as it did in 2001, 2002, it doesn't feel at all the same as 2008, which was, you know, a catastrophic um, correction. But the economy overall feels weaker to me. You know, sometimes these things are self-correcting and it's a little dip, and sometimes these things are, you know, much more severe. The hardest thing I ever did was run for public office. You famously ran for governor of California as a Republican. I did. You endorsed Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. in the last election, and uh, not much love for President Trump <laughs> from you. What's been your reaction as you've watched the Trump yeah. administration unfold? Well, as you pointed out, I was, as a lifelong Republican, I was a supporter of Hillary Clinton, uh, not for Donald Trump. And um, the reason was I thought that, um, you know, experience actually really did matter. You might remember I ran for governor, and one of the things I said is we need to run the government more like a business. Mm -hmm. Honestly, that was a little naive. Um, and so experience, and I think Hillary was the most qualified person to be president. So I think you're starting to see some of the challenges um, associated with, you know, the country's leadership. Is the dysfunction enough for you to change your party loyalties? Well, I actually am now registered as declined to state in California. Um, so um, I'm not a registered Republican I'm not anymore. I'm not a registered Democrat. I just really want the best person to lead us out of this and, you know, create economic opportunity for everybody and, and, you know, live up to the American dream. In 2008, the New York Times said you were among the women most likely to become president of the United <laughs> States. I know that you've said you would never run again. Has that changed? No, I will never run again. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that seemed pretty definitive. So, but what do you want to see in 2020? I mean, are there any candidates you're excited about? You know, it's too early to say, honestly. I'm hoping someone, when, when America has been at our most challenged times, someone arrives, you know, hopefully to, to you know, help lead the country out. I mean, you can go back, you know, you have to remember, I, I just watched Ken Burns' um, The Civil War again. That was pretty bad. I mean, honestly, and, and, you know, in comes Abraham Lincoln and navigates the country through one of the most difficult things. So I'm hoping that someone will emerge who can navigate the country through what I think is a really difficult set of circumstances. Do you think that there's a real risk of, you know, populism dividing our country? You do see big divides in this country. I mean, the biggest divide I've seen probably in my lifetime. And we are at our best when we come together to solve problems. We are at our best when there is an art of compromise. That seems to have largely broken down right now, and I don't think it's a good thing. Should another Republican challenge Donald Trump in the primaries? You know, it's hard to challenge a sitting president, right? If you look at the history, that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, but we'll see what unfolds. Are there any Democrats catching your eye? You know, there's, I think there's going to be, what, you could tell me, 24 dozen, people. at least. Yeah. <laughs> at least. And I'm certain there'll be one of those 24 that I think is, you know, interesting and, and may be able to, to lead the country. You were one of the most prominent and earliest female executives in history. Yeah. So first of all, thank you. <laughs> thank welcome. you for paving the way. What's it been like to watch Me Too unfold from that perspective? Yeah. You were here first. I was. I was. So I think it has been, um, let me give you a couple of, of analogies, surprising about how widespread this has been. It's been, I think, uplifting for many women. 
And I think it's going to fundamentally change how business is done, entertainment is done, law is done. I mean, I think it's going to change everything. And um, you could argue it was overdue. Certainly. Um, but we're in a better place as a country and as a society because of this. There's no question about Has it. Has it caused you to reflect on moments in your own career where maybe you were made to feel inadequate yeah. or small? Yeah, I think, um, you know, certainly when you are in the minority, I mean, I was, my class at um, Harvard Business School, I think was, you know, 20% women. I was in just the fourth class of women at Princeton. My first um, class at Procter & Gamble, I think, was four women out of 100. So when you're in a minority, it's, um, it's easy to feel a little bit marginalized because you're often not part of the mainstream. And um, so, you know, actually, I think calling this out and, and having people recognize the impact that they have on others is actually a really good thing. Did you feel like you couldn't be yourself at times or lead well, the way you want it to lead? I, you know, it's funny, yes. I'll tell you a little story. So I graduated from Harvard Business School and I've always gone by Meg. I show up in Procter & Gamble, it was my very first job, and I thought, okay, I've gotta be serious, I gotta be taken seriously, I'm gonna go by Margaret. It just sounded better to me at the time. And that lasted for about two weeks. <laughs> I said, okay, it's ridiculous. I mean, I've been Meg for you know 22 years, I need to be Meg. And it was an early lesson for me because I didn't know any other way to succeed other than be myself and work as hard as I could and try to figure out what was expected and try to add value and be fun to work for and be customer obsessed. So I never really lost my sense of self, maybe because of that really early experience. You know, lucky, sometimes better lucky than smart, honestly, but it just, I didn't know any other way to be. I mean, I noticed you didn't talk about this a lot over the course of your no. career. No. Be, you know, women no. didn't want to talk about being no. women, which I get. Yeah. Well, I think why not? As I have gotten older, I recognize that inspiration is a really important thing for people. You know, when I looked up at Procter & Gamble, there really were no women. Um, there were a few. Um, but, you know, I think whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, you know, a farmer, whatever, it's fun, it's, it's helpful to see someone who looks like you, who acts like you, who can, you know, you can look up to. And so I've tried to do more now as mentoring, you know, this morning I spoke to a Harvard Business School group about, you know, what it was like to, to grow up in, you know, a different era. And I think that's actually helpful to people. So I'm much, much more open to that in the last decade than I was in the first. We're, I think my generation was a little bit, put your head down, get the job done, and just persevere, which worked out okay. But I think now we have an obligation to, you know, help younger women and, you know, others sort of figure out how to make their own journey. Do you still see double standards for women in business, in politics? Yeah, certainly in politics. Mm -hmm. There's no question. The hardest thing I ever did was run for public office. And, you know, no matter what people say, it's much harder if you're a woman. It's just much harder. You know, hair, makeup, how you dress, you are judged in a way that um, I, I was very foreign to me. The good news about business is there is something called results. <laughs> you know, relative market share, return on invested capital. I mean, there's very measurable results that you can be measured on, whether you did a good job or not. In some fields, like politics, there are no results until the election. And that's hard, I think. It's hard, you know, if, you, if there's nothing that you can hang on to that says, well, okay, I'm doing a good job and I'm doing what I'm expected to, to, to have done. So how did you handle that kind of scrutiny? I found running for public office was the hardest thing I have ever done. It is a full-on combat sport. It, it, you have to be wired for combat, I think, to do well in that job. And it was probably, a, the running for office was probably a bad job person fit, honestly, because I'm not wired for combat. So I just found it incredibly difficult. And when you jump into politics at that high a level, there's just things that you don't know. And, um, you know, that's why I think to some degree career politicians, not all, but some career politicians have an advantage because just like you, you have an instinct about what to do. And I have to say, you know, much of my instincts when I was running was not finely honed. <laughs> <laughs> so as you embark on your latest startup, mm -hmm. what would your advice be to your teenage self today? I'd say a couple things. One is find something that really you love to do. I love business. I love working. And then find people you want to work with. All right. Meg Whitman, CEO of Quippy. It's, it's nice so to great see to you. Have you. Yeah, take care. Thank you.